All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for the one of the last sessions in the conference. I know we're, we're getting to the end. How's everybody feeling? <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for joining on this session. I'm Cynthia from GitHub. And before I start, I want to give a shout out to everybody that helped on this talk. There's Sean Marcia, Gia Cohen, Rachel Stanick, and Cassie Cio, who are instrumental in um, helping me on this for open source for greater good. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about first an overview of building open source in the social sector. What is the social sector? So you may be familiar with that, with nonprofits, um, but it's more than just nonprofits. It also encompasses um, UN agencies, civil society, researchers that work in that sector, and that's considered any non-governmental organization that works towards achieving the sustainable development goals. The sustainable development goals are a number of different goals that UN agencies and governments are all working towards in terms of human rights, um, eradicating poverty, uh, public health, women's rights, children's rights, education, for instance, as well. So it comprises of these non-governmental um, organizations contributing to any pressing societal issues. And some examples of that could be within global development, disaster risk management, humanitarian response, um, as we mentioned, human rights as one of the major industries that comprise of that sector. So some of the elements to highlight in terms of how that's different from other industries, um, the three main differences I wanna talk about is one with interoperability. So if in this case, interoperability really means a solution that could be used to uh, interact with each other across data, across systems, different processes to achieve a common goal and that can be used in different settings, in different regions um, and for different groups of beneficiaries. Another element is with monitoring and evaluation. Monitoring evaluation is the study of being able to measure whether the solution or the process has the intended impact when they first when they were first designed. So with monitoring is having to review and assess the implementation of those development activities. And the evaluation is having that episodic assessment of the change over time for the targeted results. So this is very important within the social sector in being able to measure if the solution they had was successful in within human rights, for instance. This really helps especially with being able to collect data, being able to have measurable impacts. So open data is really important for that and being able to adapt um, for different countries and different regions that have unique challenges. And then lastly is with resource sustainability, which is um, common in a lot of open source projects. Having accessibility and affordability are really key. And within the social sector, um, the, one of the things to, that really differentiates from industry is avoiding vendor lock-in. Having the difference with overall, um, having to consider the overall maintenance costs has a um, bigger way in decision-making for the social sector. We had a little bit on the challenges, so I want to dig a little bit deeper into that. So the challenges in building open source in the social sector, there's four main ones. There's plenty more, but I'm going to highlight these four today. One is with governance, being able to address the concerns underlying the need for encryption without undermining legitimate law enforcement objectives, especially within international human rights law. So beyond just um, where a solution is implemented in one country, being able to adhere to international human rights law, um, being able to address certain illegal harmful online content that is used across many regions is a little bit different challenge. Um, being able to support the ethical use of the tool and the production of those solutions with transparency and consistency is really important and also a challenge. That also leans into some dependency management risks as well. Next is with connectivity. Bandwidth limitations, especially within areas where internet connectivity exists, it's really tough. With um, areas with slow and unreliable internet connections, it makes it difficult for participants and community um, to download 
and upload and collaborate on open source projects efficiently. This can often lead to frustration and decreased participation, especially in, in resource constrained environments. The high data cost um, is a barrier for communities that want to contribute, um, especially, for instance, if there's a large code repository or if there are um, some real time collaboration um, platforms, like if it's a Zoom meeting and everybody often has video on, which is great, but it's difficult for communities with high data costs to want be able to contribute and be part of that community as well. So being able to, considering those limitations, one thing to highlight when you're trying to access communities with low, um, with very high data cost and low connectivity. So consider other ways to work with the communities with bandwidth limitations. Another challenge is with accessibility. Documentation is always great and highly encouraged, of course, um, but also consider that the challenge of having primarily English documentation means that you're creating a barrier for non-English speakers. So you can take a look at maybe having a community for localization for your documents. Next is resourcing. This is common, of course, um, in other open source projects with burnout and funding restraints. The sustaining models is a little bit different within the social sector as there's some organizations like nonprofits that have other legal restrictions on the type of funding they can accept or the type of um, profit generating uh, opportunities they can have. A lot of sustaining bottles may rely on either certain types of grants or donations or having revenue streams like consulting services or premium features and nonprofits may be limited in being able to provide that, which limits them from another revenue stream. All right. So one way to tackle that is through digital public goods. Has anybody heard of what digital public goods are? Awesome. Oh, cool. I'm glad to hear because sometimes you never know. Uh, so digital public goods are um, one way to be able to tackle these challenges. In 2019, the governments of Norway, Sierra Leone, and UN agencies like UNICEF and other NGOs like iSpirit initiate the Digital Public Good Alliance, which aims to share digital public goods, engage communities, and pool data sets together to help support the sustainable development goals. They are a multi-stakeholder UN endorsed initiative that really facilitates in the discovery and deployment of open source and bringing together countries, organizations, civil society, um, community developers as well to create a global ecosystem of digital public goods. Um, and what the Digital Public Good Alliance does is they maintain the register of this digital public goods, DBGs. Um, and DBGs can be open source software, open data, open models, open standards, as well as open content. They adhere to privacy laws, um, as well as best practices, they do no harm, and of course, uh, roll up to the sustainable development goals. They are non-rivalous, non-exclusive, non-exclusible. So in other words, we, can't, um, we don't want to exclude any groups of peoples and globally available. Now, anybody can nominate an open source project or content to become a digital public good as long as they adhere to the digital public good standard. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So the digital public good standard, there are a number of standards and there's a link there to take a look at other ones and we'll go through the registry as well shortly. The digital public good standard um, requests that any projects that are to be nominated to become a digital public good is that they are relevant to any of the goals um, in terms of the sustainable development goals. So they can be for health, public health, for education, for um, poverty. Uh, there's a number of different ones that I think are very relevant to open source um, projects that are currently existing. Um, of course, that they have an approved open source license. They have clear ownership, platform independence, clear documentation, adherence to privacy and applicable laws, as well as standards and best practices, and do more, no harm by design. And these solutions are really in, uh, aimed to enable open innovation um, by having those certain select open licenses as well. So here is how 
There we go. Uh, you can submit a project that you work on or that you know of to the registry. You can nominate projects as well to become a digital public good, and they are reviewed annually um, to maintain the standards through the review process. And we're going to also go through some examples of projects that you may or may not have heard of. So the first one that I have here is DHIS2. DHIS2 is um, potentially a tool that you have encountered, but a lot of times it's more for um, hospitals or governments that use this healthcare management information system. DHIS2 stands for District Health Information Software, and it's a free and open source platform for the collection, reporting, analysis, and dissemination of um, individual level data for, related to health. So they're used by national health authorities um, as well as different health programs for the management of specific diseases like HIV and malaria. And being able to collect um, the data and be able to share it within other countries were very important during the COVID-19 pandemic as well. And it's currently being used in 80 plus low and middle income countries. So I wanna show an example of that, to, there we go. So this is what it looks like um, in the DHIS2 software, and it could be, be deployed in different ways across multiple countries. So I encourage you to take a look at that if you're interested in contributing as well. Another, oh, there we go. Let's go back there. Another example of a DBG is Ursilia. Ursilia is a nonprofit that's dedicated to promoting open source science and fostering a community towards research on drug discovery as well. So their models uh, for discovery help researchers identify different drug candidates for orphaned and neglected diseases. Um, they really want to encourage more participation within that research because a lot of times for neglected diseases, um, it takes many years and billions and millions of dollars to develop a single new medication. And oftentimes pharmaceutical companies may focus on drug discovery efforts in more high return on investment uh, regions and diseases. So as a result, sometimes low and middle income countries get left behind. Arcelia's, they have a hub of computational models that make it very cheap to run experiments in laboratories for researchers. Um, and they aim to maintain the research in country as well. So I'm gonna pull up there so I can take a look at that if you're interested in contributing as well. And our last example that we have here is with Open Terms Archive. So Open Terms Archive publicly records every version of terms of service, um, except for digital services. And they collect, I believe, 600 plus contractual documents, different terms of service, terms of use, um, privacy policies as well for different online platforms and service providers. This way, all the users that um, you agree to any terms of service whenever there's a change to it. Users often, they are notified, but they don't really take a look at what is the difference. So Open Terms Archives really address that critical gap um, and the ability of activists and journalists to understand and analyze the influence of those differences for the users. So this is important for any regulatory agencies, legislative authorities, media and press, as well as consumer protection association. They focus a lot on mis and disinformation and they have a number of different, I believe open issues for anybody who are interested in contributing. So this is Open Terms Archive as well. And I believe that they were nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize um, either last year or the year before. Okay. And now those are three different examples, but there are of course hundreds of other of, um, digital public goods or open source for good projects. And one thing I do wanna know if anybody wants to contribute to any of these projects, GitHub also has a for good first issue list. If you're not sure on how to get involved or you just want to work on one issue in a lightweight way, 
The for good first issue is similar to other good first issue types of lists where you can find a list of issues for you to get involved with. If you're new to open source, it's a great way to get involved. Or if you have a project that you think could benefit from a community or the, and they um, contribute to so social impact in any way, you can add it to this list. And I'm gonna go through one example of a for good first issue project as well. Um, this project was built, the Human Essentials app, was built by Ruby for Good. And it's an inventory management system that builds to address the needs of diaper banks. So diaper banks are a type of human essentials bank. And um, one challenge that occurred is that a lot of banks in different regions, they don't often talk to each other and they have trouble maintaining inventory, receiving donations and other human essential supplies beyond diapers like period supplies. And they have issues with distributing with other, other local community organizations like shelters or other community centers that require diapers, for instance. So Ruby for Good got together and created an app to make it really easy to monitor all the, um, the supplies that they have and also work with other 200 registered banks um, in the U.S., then as a result, I think as of today, they've helped over 3 million children receive diapers um, in the, I believe, past two years that they've launched. And so they are also looking for some help. So if anybody is interested in helping on the, in the Human Essentials Bank, they are also listed in the For Good First Issue list. I'm going to actually put up a QR code as well. For anybody interested in contributing, you can find projects like Human Essentials on there and other projects that you can contribute to um, that are digital public goods or are open source for social impact. So I see we have some time for Q&A. There's a lot of information. I'm going to open up for Q&A now for anybody who have questions. Yes, please. Yeah, that one's um, it's seen it done in two different ways. One in terms of having a community-led localization. So one organization, Digital Good, also that the way that they tackle that is having community members from different countries translate their documents. Um, Ifme.org is the organization. They work on mental health um, resources for their community, and they ask their community members, "Can you please translate?" So they have a list of issues asking for translators, and that's one way that they've decided to work on translation rather than having like Google Translate, for instance. They rather have the local community translate the documentation in a way that is um, understandable for local speakers as well. Um, other projects that I've seen has been through some like the language translation, that helps for documentation. I like the way IFMI has done it as well because it also contributes to their community too. That is one challenge. I've seen different projects do it, so I don't have the perfect answer for that, but I'd love to know from, from the audience here on any suggestion on software too. Yeah. So uh, I used to work with um, uh, a project called the Localization Lab that's more, that works specifically with software that's used by like, university companies. Uh, so, so they work with a platform called Plant Effects and also some other localization platforms, and they do have also like more work on Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. A good question. Any other questions we can help answer? I know it's the end of the day, so I can release you guys and give you the gift of time as well. <laughs> Wait, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so the human essentials thing, mm -hmm. uh, like, what do you mean by human essentials? Like, I know you mentioned diapers. Yeah. 
Let me go back. Uh, so human essentials relates to, it could be diapers, could be period supplies. Um, so it's different from like a food bank, for instance, and related to more uh, healthcare type of supplies. Yeah, they were built by Ruby for Good. Um, you can take a look at them as well. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. If there are any other questions I can help answer. Please. Of course. Oh, yes. So that color code at the bottom right here is related to this um, with SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals. So let me pull up a list of all the Sustainable Development Goals. And this one is number nine on, oh, da -da, I believe, innovation. Uh, SDG. Let's see. So this is goal number nine. So there are a number of, yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, that is um, one thing that we can go over as well because there was other ones that was green for, I believe, number, yeah. oh, group. Um, goal number three on, oh no, public health. Where are the SDGs? Yeah, I believe we can go back to the main list of them. But um, while we're here, so SDGs are a number of different goals. And the one item they have is, oh, no, overview. The way that you can, the target and indicators, here we go. In terms of being able to measure, we mentioned with monitoring and evaluation on how you know this open source project, for instance, is actually contributing to um, innovation. So we have an indicator here of proportion of small scale industries with a loan or line of credit or being able to have certain total industry value added. So this is definitely more related to how countries may measure. Um, we can take a look at uh, the goals. There we go. Number three, where the Ursilia project is related to goal number three on ensuring health healthy lives and promote the well-being of all ages and their targets and indicators could relate to something um, very measurable with reducing the goal of the global maternal mortality ratio. So that's one way that they measure whether this open source project is actually moving that forward or not. Yeah, you're welcome. Cool. All right. And let's see. The progress info. That one's always really interesting too, with different numbers. Yeah. So you mentioned that the digital public goods um, that like list of projects gets evaluated mm -hmm. every year. Who evaluates them? Uh, that's a good question. So the Digital Public Goods Alliance, they evaluate all the different projects. Uh, so here is the registry. And they go through each one based on technical review by the um, Digital Public Good Alliance and the other member states are on there. So here's an example of them and they make sure that they all adhere to the standard. Usually they are UNICEF or UN agency member staff. Yes, so the standard is also open. So uh, member states and other individuals can take a look and provide recommendations for that as well. So we can actually go on the GitHub and take a look at that too. So if you have a comment, you can lean on there if there's something that you do not agree with that standard. Great, we have quite a bit of time. Um, I can also open this up to talk a little bit more about DBGs if you're interested in DBGs, because I think one challenge that um, the DBJ has been trying to tackle is on discoverability. I'd love to turn it out to the audience here on what recommendations you have on organizations like D the Digital Public Good Alliance on what they can do better on discoverability. There's the challenge of here's a social sector, here's governments that may not be as familiar with open source communities. What can they do better? 
for discoverability of open source projects. <laughs> That's a tough question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a tough one. Yeah, email me later if you have any suggestions at all. Great. They do. So um, they do work with the WHO OSPO. Um, I believe ITU is also planning on launching their OSPO as well. Um, but not so much. I think the one challenge as well on the projects that are developed from the social sector is that often they develop first closed and then they open it, but there's that challenge there. Um, and being able to change that has been a slow process. And I believe the UN is also planning on releasing their own set of open source licenses to make it a little bit easier for them to develop. Great, well, thank you class for taking time on this talk. Um, this has changed a little bit, but this was really fun. And thank you so much everybody for staying in this late afternoon, last day of the conference.